Yeah, we're going to be talking about identity. Yeah, that's why that's up there. Identity theft. Let me just welcome you to Grace Life TV here at, uh, at the El Paso campus, as well as let me just welcome all of you joining us online, <laughs> literally around the United States and around the world, uh, even at, down in Australia, in Iceland, and China, and France, and all those different kind of places. We're just glad to have you with us today. Lord bless you. Uh, this is, uh, let me just welcome you to week number four of our series called The Abundant Life. And in this series, what we're talking about is not only how you can find real free peace and true freedom in your life, but also kind of how you can discover why it is that you don't have that peace and freedom in your life sometimes that you feel like you ought to have. You know, a lot of times we do kind of a, we need to do kind of a self-check to discover why it is that we have this, uh, we do the negative things that we do and that we feel the negative ways that we feel in our lives sometimes. And in this series, what we're doing is we're filling in what I call a life diagram. And you can get a copy of that back there or wherever, and, or you can look at this one here. And you can kind of, you know, by the time we're done with this, you'll be able to kind of get an idea of how to, to kind of discover within your own life what's going on and how to, how to change that within your own life. Because what we've discovered so far is that my identity is directly determined by where my identity, where I find my identity, or my identity, where I believe life is found. So it's important for us to understand that, that any time that we uh, try to, do, to identify ourselves, right, try to find our own identity, that my identity is directly determined by where I believe life is found. Okay? That's important for us to understand and important for us to know. Because you know, what, if we choose to find our identity in the world, then I guarantee you, you're just never going to come to a, an answer. That answer is going to be constantly changing. Uh, the only thing the world has to offer is what I would call perceived truth. You can see that up there, that the world in the world is only perceived truth. Now we're going to kind of take a look at the left side of this uh, diagram first of all, and then we'll move to the other side. But, but the fact is that the perceived truth, the world only has perceived truth. Things in the world are only perceived truth, and certainly they do, they do look like true, uh, look true, and, and have a lot, ring of truth about them, and all those different kinds of things. But I guarantee you, the only place truth is found is in Jesus Christ. That's the only place. So today we're going to begin our, or continue our study in, uh, in uh, about identity. And there's, I want to take you to a very familiar passage in the book of Genesis. I know we get, I just, I, I just can't help it. We keep going back to Genesis because there's so much to be found there. I'm just constantly amazed at how much there is in that creation account that, that tells us about who we are today and why we do the things that we do in our lives. And today we're going to be talking about that a little bit more because there's a, that, very, that same passage in the Old Testament in, in the book of Genesis that speaks directly to, uh, to the subject of identity. Uh, we've talked about that, uh, that particular event uh, several different times in different ways, but it also speaks to our identity. It was that moment in history when Adam and Eve were encouraged by Satan to eat of that forbidden fruit, you know, to make a choice in their lives about where they would find their identity. That's really what it boils down to when we talk about identity and who we are. And then not only how, where they would find their identity, but what method they would use uh, to determine who they are. Which, there, which we only have these two possibilities. Remember, we can either find our identity in the world or we can find our identity in Christ. Okay? Only those two possibilities. So, not only would they decide, have this opportunity to decide where they would find their identity, but what method they would use to determine who they are, which, is, which also is a, a very, the very same moment in history when the, when the subject of personal identity was forever altered uh, forever, you know, confused, complicated, convoluted, all of those big words. At that moment in history, personal identity was completely confused and muddled up and messed up from that time on. Because you all know the story. Uh, Satan came along in the form of certain serpent and deceived Eve into taking uh, the first bite out of that fruit which God said, you shall not eat of it, right? But what you may not know about this particular uh, event is that even though it is widely accepted, even though the majority of our world today accepts this as being fact, uh, Adam was not deceived by the serpent. Okay? Because our world and most, most religions and most people, uh, most churches and denominations, uh, they just say, well, you know, they were, Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan. No, they weren't. 
Adam was not deceived. And you need to follow this with me before you shut me off and say, I'm crazy. You follow this through with me and you'll see that, that what the Bible says here is true. That in this, in this particular incident, uh, incident, yeah, I guess that's the right word, uh, Adam was not deceived by the serpent, uh, nor, was, nor was he deceived by Eve. Okay? Adam wasn't deceived either by the serpent, nor was he deceived by Eve into giving into this particular temptation. Hold on to that, because we're going to be talking about that in a little bit. So take a look at what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14 about this particular event. And he says, it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Okay. Now, ladies, let me ask you this question. Does that make you feel a little bit squirmy? You know, like maybe Paul was a male chauvinist pig, you know? Uh, maybe so. You know, matter of fact, I've had women tell me directly in years past that were just all pissed off and upset and when they came across this passage and, they, and, and other passages that Paul talked about. Of course, that kind of tainted their uh, idea of who Paul is and what Paul's like. But they, they told me directly that Paul was nothing more than a male chauvinist pig. That's all he was. He hated women. He probably wasn't married, you know, all those different kinds. Or if he had been married, then that's why he wasn't anymore, and he just hated women, you know, those kind of things. He didn't like women. Well, so why do people often think that? Well, this passage is one of those passages that kind of looks like it leans that direction. Because on the surface, it certainly sounds like Paul is being very unkind, doesn't it? When he says, well, Adam wasn't deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and fell into transgression. Right? You could read it that way if you wanted to. You say, you know, that's what Paul says. This guy, it wasn't our guy's fault. It's your, it's your fault. You're the one who decided to be deceived, received by Satan and fell into this transgression, you know? Uh, so I'll be the first to admit that it definitely looks like Paul is slamming the female gender, you know? It looks like, it looks like that's what he's doing if you don't read it carefully enough. So listen closely, and I want you to hear this very clearly, that that is not what's happening here at all. That's not what's happening here. That's not what he said. It's easy for us to read it that way because maybe we have some preconceived ideas or we've already got a chip on our shoulder or whatever the case might be, but that's not what Paul's saying. That's not, that's not what this is about at all. Paul is not putting women down, nor is he saying that women are the weaker sex. As a matter of fact, if anything, he's saying just the opposite. If anything, he's saying the opposite. So I believe that Paul's point here, that the point he's making is simply the fact that, and if you get your outline in your, in, in your menu, uh, Adam's sin was different. That's all. It was different. It wasn't worse. It wasn't, hers wasn't worse. His wasn't better. Hers wasn't better. There is no such thing. When it comes right down to it, Adam's sin was different. In other words, even though Adam did not sin in the same way that his that Eve did, his sin, uh, and I want to say this carefully, but may have been even more sinful than Eve's, if that were possible. I don't think that's possible. I think sin is sin, and that's the way that is. Uh, it, it, it all, both, uh, no matter what it is, it results in the same end. You know, a loss of uh, of life uh, within us. So either way, it doesn't make any difference. But on a human level, we could almost say that in some ways, maybe Adam's sin was even more sinful than Eve's, if that were actually possible. Well, why? Because, because of the fact that Adam, uh, Adam made his decision to eat of the forbidden fruit with full knowledge of exactly what he was doing. Now, in that passage we read a minute ago, it said that, that Eve was deceived. We'll look at that in a second. But Adam's sin was different. He, he knew what he was doing. He, fell, he didn't fall into it. He was, you know, bamboozled into believing, you know, uh, Satan's lies and, uh, and, and falling for his snow job, you know. Uh, but, but there was reason for that, I think. So let me ask you this question. What's the opposite of being deceived? What's the opposite of being deceived? Well, if you're going to do something... And you were deceived into doing something. What's the opposite of doing something? You did it on purpose, right? You, you can be deceived into doing something, or you can just flat out right do it on purpose. 
right? One or the other. So I, in my opinion, the opposite of being deceived into doing something is doing it on purpose, that you, with, you have full knowledge. Okay, so let's look at the biblical account and, and uh, see that for what it is, see what, what he says there. Um, and in, in, in Genesis it says, <clears throat> and, it was, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but woman. This is in, I'm looking for the Genesis one, I guess, I think. Yeah, in Genesis um, 2.16 it says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And then if you jump ahead to the next verse, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Now, I've, I've highlighted that word then for a reason. It may not be readily apparent, but, but, you, but I want you to notice that. What I want you to see here is that, it's, uh, that God had specifically told Adam before he was even created not to eat of this forbidden fruit, right? Can you see that there? That's what's happening. That God commanded Adam, saying, not eat. and then, after God told Adam, then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. In other words, Eve hadn't been created yet. Okay, that's, a, that's one thing we need to notice, at least. We need to keep that in our minds, at least. I don't know if we want to make a whole lot or maybe too much out of that, but we do need to at least see that, okay? Um, now jump ahead to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? Okay. Now I want you to jump ahead again to verse 6 when it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was des the desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband who was with, who was with her, and he ate. Okay, so check that out. Look at that for a moment because it's important that we see the events that are taking place there. Because what's going on is that, um, well, let me ask you just a question or two here. Do you think that, e that Adam told Eve that she wasn't supposed to eat of that forbidden fruit? I I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. Uh, if he didn't tell her, it came out in regular conversation at the very least because... You know, if they could eat of any tree of the fruit, uh, fruit of the garden, tree of the garden, and they were wandering, wandering through the garden, and Eve says, hey, look at this one. And Adam probably said, no, you, no, we can't, you know. At the very least, that's what happened, right? She knew better. She knew not to eat of that, of that forbidden fruit. So I'm certain that he, that, that he told her. And, and the other question is, was Adam standing right there? Wasn't Adam standing right there when she was being tempted by the serpent? Well... Uh, more like, more than likely, he was. But that's not the point. Okay, certainly Adam told Eve that she shouldn't eat of the fruit and forbidden fruit. More than likely, probably, I'm going to say certainly, Adam was standing there because it says that gave it to her husband who was with her. I assume that's saying that he was right there standing there with her when she was being deceived and all whatever kind of things. That's not the point. The point is, is that Adam made his choice with his eyes wide open. That's the point. The point is, is that Adam knew exactly what he was doing while he was doing it. Do you see that? Uh, Eve was deceived and fell in transgression. Adam did it with his eyes wide open. So let me ask you this question. Who does the Bible say is the great deceiver? Satan, not Eve, right? Not Eve. So if, if Adam wasn't deceived by Satan and Eve is not the great deceiver, then he wasn't deceived by Eve either because God had already spoke to him directly and said, you're not going to eat of this. Don't do that. You don't do that. So what you need to know, and we've talked about this before, but I'm going to bring it up again to, as we can kind of follow this through, is that... Is that uh, there was a period of time right in the middle of verse 6 here when Eve was a sinner and Adam was not. There, there was, I don't know if it was a moment, I don't know if it was an hour or two, I don't know what it was. It was probably just a few moments, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the opportunity was there. The period of time was there when Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit and God had withdrawn his life from her and, and Adam had not. Okay? 
may have been a long time, may have been a very, very short time. More than likely it was very short. So, <clears throat> so the question is, why is that important? Well, because at that very moment in time, Adam had a choice to make. At that moment in time, Adam had a choice to make. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, Adam had an unbelievable, unprecedented opportunity at that moment in time, right in the middle of verse 6, to think about what Eve had done and then to consider his own options and decide for himself what he might do in relation to Eve and in relation to God. A sobering thought, is it not? It is for me. If you can catch what's going on there, it's a pretty sobering thing. Here's Eve, having eaten, <coughs> been deceived by Satan, and fell into transgression. And here's Adam, who now is, he's lost her. She's, uh, you know, spiritually dead, without life of Christ within her, having, being a sinner. And here's him, still on the other side of the fence, and has this decision to make. Knowing full well what this decision should be, because he'd already been told by God what he should do, and he has this decision to make. Should I follow God and leave Eve? Or should I follow Eve and leave God? Those are the two decisions. The same two decisions we're talking about in our identity. Either it's in Christ or it's in the world. The same two decisions. It started way back then. And it hasn't changed. Okay, so again, here's Eve having already eaten of this forbidden fruit. And God had already withdrawn his life from her. And there's Adam standing there looking at her and thinking to himself, you know what? Uh, man, now what do I do? You know? Can you imagine the turmoil that's inside of him at that moment in time? We've all been, we've all stood in those positions at times, haven't we? When there's, you have a decision to make and you know they're both really serious decisions and, you, and your guts begin to boil, you know? <laughs> and, you, and your body tightens up and your pulse uh, gets rapid and you start to sweat and you go, what do I do? You know, you, then you feel like a little schoolgirl, you know, <laughs> having to make a decision. What do I do? Just tell me what to do, right? Just tell me what to do. Somebody. Somebody tell me what to do. Well, if somebody tells you what to do, then it's their fault if it was a wrong decision, right? That's always nice when it's... Ha well, that's, always what's, that's when it's always nice to have somebody else tell you what to do. And, and I think that, in my opinion, I think that's why religion is so popular today. Uh, uh, legalism and all those kind of things, because... I could stand up here and give you one, two, three. Do this, do that, and do the other thing. And if you do that, you'll be right with God. Amen. But then if things go wrong in your life, then it's the preacher's fault, not yours, right? I did what you told me to do. Uh, well, no, I'm going to leave it open. You decide what to do. It's up to you, not up to me. It's up to you. You've got you to decide what the Holy Spirit wants you to do in your life, Right? I'll give you what the truth is, and then from there on, you've got to decide for yourself. So, so on the other hand, on the one hand, you've got to see, put yourself in Adam's position. Guys, put yourself in Adam's position. Because on the one hand, she's the most gorgeous thing he's ever seen. I guarantee you. I mean, she's a babe. You know what I'm saying? She's the smartest, kindest, sexiest, gentlest woman he has ever known. The most intimate soulmate a man could ever ask for. You know, that's what us guys are looking for. <laughs> we still do, you know. And on the other hand, there's God. Now, don't get me wrong, because you've got to understand, on the one hand, certainly, she's the most gorgeous, sexiest thing he's ever seen, you know, the, the most intimate soulmate he has ever had in his life, in his physical life. On the other hand, there's God, who is the one who created him. The one who has made him to be who he is. Not only that, but he's the one that gave her to him. 
Why would you doubt somebody like that, right? Why would you doubt somebody who gives you the most awesome, precious gift in the whole wide world? Well, so on the one hand, then, even though Adam didn't know what life would be like with her, now that she was on the other side of the fence in that sense, now that she's chosen to be the God of her own life, on the other side of that, he, he couldn't imagine living life without her. He didn't know what life would be like without her, but he couldn't imagine living life without her. So what did Adam do? Y'all know, know the answer to that. What did he do? He, he chose Eve over God, did he not? He, he made a decision. Adam chose to find his identity in someone other than God. Adam chose to find his identity in Eve. So, okay, so what you need to know then at this point in time is that at that very moment in time, the interpersonal relational dynamics between men and women for, were forever changed. It's a really interesting subject, and I'd like to expound on that some other time. I'm going to give you the basics here. Uh, but at that very moment in time, the interpersonal relational dynamics between men and women changed. Uh, and, not just between men and women, but between mankind and God. So let me ask you a very important and very interesting, I think interesting question at this at, right here. In what way then did Eve change in how she related to Adam? Because that's really what we're talking about. The interpersonal relational dynamics totally changed. So in what way did Eve change in relation to Adam? We'll answer the other question in a moment. In what way did Eve change in relation to Adam? Well, from the moment that Eve gave in to Satan's temptation, she began either showing by her busyness that she has no need for a man in her life, or, uh, you know, that, or, and, that, and that she's in control of her own life. She doesn't have any need for a man, and she's in control of her own life. Or, she's pissed off because you didn't do what she thought you ought to do. Am I right? And, and generally, it's an odd combination of both, quite honestly. Now, I'm not picking on the ladies because I'm, I'm going to pick on the men in a minute, and it's worse, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm a guy. But, but, the, but the way Eve changed is that from that moment on, her, she's got her own life. She had no need for a man in her life anymore. Or she's pissed off at Adam because he didn't do what he should have done, which was... Yeah, to say to her, Eve, don't do this. That's Satan. He's deceiving you. We already know what God said. He did not do what he should have done. So from that point on, when we're looking at men and saying, either I don't need you, because I already made the decision I can live life without you, or I'm mad at you because you didn't stand up to be the warrior you should have been. You know what? She's right on both counts. Okay, now the question then is fair on both sides, right? Meaning that in what ways did Adam change in his relationship with Eve? Well, actually, because of the fact that Adam chose Eve over God, Eve chose to be her, the God of her own life, so did Adam in that sense, but maybe a little more deeper than that. Adam chose Eve over, Eve over God. Adam, by default then, chose to find his identity in her instead of in God. Or you could put in the world there because that applies to all of us. So in your outline, in your notes, you'll see there that it says that, that Adam, Adam made that decision. Okay, so look at what, Genesis, what it says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12 about how Adam decided, Adam's decision affected his view of Eve and how it changed him and how, it began to, and how he began to relate to her. It says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. I know, we've all seen that before. We've probably, probably been you know, hammered with it a time or two or whatever, but 
what I want you to see here in, in, a, in a more um, uh, intellectual level maybe is from the moment that Adam chose Eve over God, Adam began expecting her. Right? Remember? He decided to make her the God of his life rather than, than God. So at that point in time then what he began doing is expecting her to not only make him feel like a man, but the way he expects her to do that is by meeting every need within his life. Can you see that? That God was the one who, in the previously, who was meeting every need in his life. Now that he chose her over God, he's saying, well, God used to do that, but now that's your responsibility. Whoa, that ain't good, is it? Ladies, you're probably going, you know, you're right. So that's what he expects. Sorry, sucker. Well, he can say sorry, sucker on the other side too because, you know, uh, yeah, we already talked about that. I'm going to leave that alone. Okay, so he's expecting her to meet every need in his life from sex to food to keeping, up, to keeping the house clean to raising the kids to washing the clothes to always being, always looking perfectly beautiful even when she's sick, you know. Because he doesn't want to be embarrassed by her being looking bad, right? It's all about him now. Just like on her side, it's all about her. That's the problem. When we make that decision to find our identity in anything other than God, it's always somebody else's fault. And it's all about me, not about them. However, because it's not possible for her to live up to his expectations, since it's not possible for her to live up to my expectations, nor is it her responsibility to make me feel like a man or to make me be the warrior that God has created me to be, then I'm going to put this in first person just because it makes it more understandable, then we want to blame her for all of our problems. Right? We want to blame her for all of our problems. Not only that, but when she fails, and she will fail, when she fails to fill all of my needs and wants, then us guys always believe that there's someone else out there, someone else out there who will. Why do you think that married men are always looking outside of their marriage for somebody else to fill their needs? Because they think she didn't do it. Like like Adam thought she should. Uh, Adam was previous to that. God was filling all his needs. Now that he chose her, he's expecting her to fill all his needs. And once he doesn't do that, then he makes another choice, and another choice, and another choice, and another choice. And it never ends. That's why finding our identity in Christ is of utmost importance. Because he is the one who fills all your needs, not her. He is the one who fills all your needs, not him. Okay, so listen guys, we want, there's no doubt, we want to be the warrior that God created us to be. But on the other hand, we're always afraid, we're always afraid that we don't have what it takes. And then when we do fail, we want to blame her and ultimately God, right? Well, the woman gave it to me. And you're the one that gave me the woman. Right? Can you see the dynamics that are there? It's all rolled up into this, this single account. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. We can see all of those dynamics taking place within our personal lives, within our you know, married lives, and, all, and between men and women of all, of all kinds, and all ages. Those same dyma dynamics apply. And we can see that it all began right here. If we can understand that, then we can also understand that we need to go back and change that by putting God at the head of our lives, not her. Like putting God at the head of our lives, not him. Or ourselves. Or whoever. So you can fill in the blank, you know. Where did Adam and Eve believe life was found? Well, Adam thought life was found in, in her. Or in the world. Either way works. It's all the same thing, not in God. We all want to find our identity in something other than God. Okay, so let me kind of draw all this together. Have you noticed, have you noticed how, 
Remember we began that life diagram with the very top word, which was what? Relationship. That it's all the overarching idea behind all of this is about relationship. That even when we talk about our own personal identity, relationship continues to be the overarching need within our lives. God is about relationship. That's what the, that's what the point is. That God is all about relationship. That's who He is. So here's a final question. Where do you believe life is found? Which, which side do you fall on? Well, listen, if you think that life is found in her, you're going to be just like Adam. You're going to be blaming her and blaming God for giving her to you, and then you're going to be looking somewhere else. Guaranteed. The fact, if, the fact is, if you believe life is found in the world, you can, you can put a bazillion other words in these little boxes down here. The ones I've got here, and we'll talk about those in a little while, are appearance and entertainment and family and sports and job and a bazillion other things. You can fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. Any, anything and everything fills in there. We'll talk about that in another week or two. But, you know, on the other hand, when we, fought, when we allow Christ to show us who has created us to be, when we allow Christ to, to show you, when you allow Christ to show you who he has created you to be, your search will be over and your life will be fulfilled because He is the one who created you, He knows who He created you to be, and He will fill all the, fulfill all the needs in your life. You know what? When that happens, when He fulfills all of your needs within your life, you're not expecting her to do it anymore. When He fulfills all your needs in your life, you're not looking at Him and saying, I don't need you. You're looking at Him and saying, God blessed me with you. Right? And and I know that you're fallible like I am. And sometimes you're not the warrior you should be. And he looks at you and says, you know what? I know you're fallible. Sometimes you're not as pretty as I think you should be. Or as kind or as gentle. It's okay. It takes 100% on both sides. To understand that unless Christ is at the head, we're going to have problems. Uh, let me just say one other thing. Whenever I do a wedding, I always uh, talk to the couple. Uh, and I say, you know what? It's, it's like a triangle. Here's you. Here's her. Here's God. And you know what? The closer you get to God, the closer you get together. You understand that? Here's you. Here's her. And the closer each one of you gets to God, the closer you get together. So as long as we both, we all put God at the pinnacle of our lives, we'll be close together. Because God is the one who guides our lives. We don't have to look outside and blame anybody else for our problems. We know who we are. And we know who everybody else is. And we know, we know that sin isn't the issue anyway. So give it up, right? Give it up. It's not about the blame. <laughs> It's not about who's to blame. We're all to blame. God's awesome. So, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that in Him, in Jesus, was the life. And the life was the light of men. That's where life is found, is in Jesus Christ. And only in Him, not in someone else. So as long as you find your life in Him, hey, everything else takes care of itself. Guys, I know. We want to be the warrior that God has created us to be. But you know what? We aren't all the time. But you know what? You depend on God. He will make you the warrior that you, that you should be, that He created you to be. Because, as I always say, the Lord is a warrior. He was already won that battle for us. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is His name. And we can depend on Him for our very life because He is our life. Amen. Lord bless you all. Amen.